Scene opens with a lady who looks from a bridge into a river and then flies there. The story loses its colors and is transferred to the piano. And what a life without the piano. A girl named Bella selflessly taps the keys with her hands and feet. She is caught by Godwin, a man with the face of a badly assembled jigsaw puzzle. At lunch, Bella eats with her hands and spits out tasteless food. And Godwin digests his food with a medical device that resembles a moonshine machine. When he leaves for work, the girl awkwardly runs after him, calling him daddy and ignoring the goose dog underfoot. Godwin teaches surgery at London's anatomy theater. Most of the students look at his face instead of the cadavers. Only one student named Max admires the hereditary doctor whose father built the educational institution. The other students laugh at Max, but the doctor notices the young man who is offered the role of assistant in a new home project after class where Bella enjoys breaking dishes. When she notices Godwin, she happily throws herself on his neck. When she is introduced to Max, the girl shyly punches him in the nose then awkwardly begins to dance. The doctor explains that she is not mentally ill just suffers from the effects of a traumatic brain injury. An assistant is needed to take detailed notes on her development. Max agrees, even though he sees that Bella pissed herself while dancing. From that moment on, Max follows her relentlessly, functioning as a not-yet-invented Facebook, recording her every move, from breakfast to visits to Dr. Godwin's operating room. In the operating room, Bella helps the scientist by grabbing a scalpel and stabbing the corpse in the eye socket with joyful cries. In her spare time, the girl feeds Godwin's animals, which would be more appropriate for another doctor. Dr. Dr. Moreau. One day, before Bella goes to bed, Godwin reads her a book about the journey. After that, Bella develops an interest in the outside world. She climbs the stairs to the roof, ignoring Max's warning that it is dangerous. Bella declares that she wants to leave the house, which she has never left. After being refused, she skillfully throws a tantrum, forcing Godwin to agree. They ride into town in a mechanical carriage. After reaching the forest, Bella goes outside and enjoys wallowing in the fallen leaves. At the picnic, she asks Godwin about his broken fingers. He tells her about his father, an eminent scientist who experimented on him. He broke his fingers to watch his nails grow back. He was a man of unorthodox thinking. On the way home, Bella asks to stop for a walk. When she is refused, she lashes out at the doctor, forcing him to use chloroform. While Bella sleeps it off at home, Max finds documents about the experiment on her. Godwin admits that he used the body of a pregnant woman who threw herself off a bridge to put the baby's brain in her head and revive the creature. That's why Bella acts like a child. Soon, she goes through puberty. She uses the fruits and vegetables at the table to satisfy herself. The girl rushes to share her discovery with the maid and Max, but they tell her it is indecent. Discussing the incident, Godwin suggests that Max marry Bella. Max is surprised as he thought the scientist wanted to marry her himself. But Godwin's genitals have suffered from his father's inhuman experiments, and his feelings are more paternal. And you can't let a green goblin hook up with Spider-Man's girlfriend. Max proposes marriage to Bella, which she accepts, to touch each other's genitals. Godwin invites a lawyer named Duncan to draw up a prenuptial agreement. While the doctor is reading the documents, the lawyer tells him that he wants to go to the bathroom. But instead of going to the bathroom, he prowls around the house looking for a bride. He finds her in a closet and is enchanted by her beauty and naivety. At night, Duncan succumbs to his adventurous spirit and does a good foolish thing and climbs through the window to Bella, who is touching herself. They are like two shingles talking on the roof. Duncan lies in the girl's ears and offers to travel with him and see the world. While Godwin is cutting up the brains, Bella, who has already washed a similar organ, comes to report the impending escape. The scientist is against it, but the girl insists that she needs a real adventure. She packs her things and Max shows up. The girl promises to marry him when she returns. The guy threatens to punch his rival in the face, but Bella calms him down with a chloroformed handkerchief. Godwin appears next and sews money into the hem of her dress for a rainy day. Waking up next to the pig chicken, Max goes to see the scientist. Godwin has gotten drunk out of grief. The scene shifts to Lisbon. Bella, whose life has literally taken on a new color, not only sleep together with Duncan, she also tries out various delicacies. Oysters, champagne, eclairs. One day, while a bedraggled Duncan sleeps, the girl leaves her hotel room to see the city. She wanders the streets, watching the gondolas move along a cable, admiring the exotic architecture, stopping to listen to a woman singing on a balcony with a lute. A girl witnesses an expressive argument between a couple and climbs to the roof where she vomits, not from the panorama, but from an overdose of eclairs. Bella returns to the hotel room to find a nervous Duncan waiting for her. The couple goes to dinner with Duncan's clients. At the table, the girl does not hesitate to spit the food back into the plate and also comments directly on the veiled euphemism and plans to hit the screaming baby. An annoyed Duncan has to explain how to behave. Later, Bella runs away again to go to a bar where she tries strong alcohol. Having drunk until she passes out and slept on the floor, the girl returns to the hotel. At the hotel, a lady calls her
her Victoria, but realizes she's mistaken and leaves. Duncan doesn't like Bella's willfulness, but there's nothing he can do about it. At dinner, the girl starts dancing, rocking out on the dance floor. It's not disco yet, but it's not La La Land either. A jealous lawyer joins her and is forced to start a fight with competitors who have their eyes on his companion. Later in bed, he notices words written in ink on her thighs. Some man has left his signature. Duncan realizes that he cannot control her unbridled temper. Out of grief, he goes to the bar to drink, but Bella finds him there and tells him how she gave herself to another man. In the morning, Duncan says he has a surprise for her to quench her adventurous spirit. He offers to hide her in a chest, which he takes to a cruise ship. However, the girl fears that he wants to drown her in the sea. She locks herself in the bathroom and stays there until late. In the evening, Bella leaves her cabin and wanders around the deserted ship. She makes it to the deck and ends up dozing on a chaise long. Having gotten used to the new environment, she continues to be offended by Duncan for his decision. She is gradually reading books, gaining smart words and new knowledge. Later, Bella meets two passengers, the elderly and straightforward Martha and the cynical nihilist Harry. Bella admits that she is little bored of Duncan. Duncan doesn't like her new friends. The lawyer proposes marriage to Bella, but she reminds him that she is engaged to Max, whom she will marry when she returns home. Duncan wants to prevent her from socializing with her new acquaintances, fearing that talking philosophy will have a negative effect on her character, which is already not sugar. The lawyer even throws overboard the books Martha gives Bella. Duncan drowns his sorrow in wine and gambling. At one point, Bella is aroused by his aggression. Duncan even pretends to be ready to throw Harry and Martha overboard. Intimacy alone isn't enough for her anymore. Tormented by philosophical ideas, she goes to Harry. Instead of calming the restless soul with conversation, conversation, the man suggests taking a walk on the Alexandria waterfront. From the balcony of a restaurant for the rich, Harry shows Bella a poor neighborhood where children are dying of hunger in the streets. What she sees makes a deep impression on the girl, bordering on hysteria. Shocked by the injustice of this world, she returns to the cabin, where a drunken Duncan sleeps on a pile of money he won at the casino. The girl collects the money in a box to give to the poor. On her way out, she is stopped by sailors. They warn that the liner is about to leave. The sailors volunteer to give money to the poor and Bella naively agrees. In the cabin, she tells a waking Duncan that she gave all the money to charity. This infuriates him. After learning that they have nothing in their pockets, the captain orders the passengers to disembark at the nearest port. A luxury voyage is not for bankrupts. Bella manages to say goodbye to Harry, who has shown her the imperfections of society. The girl thinks that his role in her destiny is over. On land, the travelers reach Paris. Duncan worries that Bella, who is used to taking everything from life without thinking where the money comes from, is optimistic about the world. Looking for a hotel, she stumbles upon a brothel whose owner offers her a job as a prostitute. I need money. I love sex, Bella thinks and easily agrees. After earning money and being disappointed by the fact that not everyone is like Duncan in bed, the girl goes back to the lawyer. Duncan, having learned how Bella earned money for food, becomes furious. His emotions completely disappoint the girl. The pores of love leave her head and she, having uncovered her father's stash and address, wants to buy him a ticket home. But the lawyer takes the money and leaves. Out of habit, Bella thinks for a moment and returns to the brothel. She is accepted with open arms. Fortunately, in a civilized society, there is no lack of demand for corrupt love. Realizing that men can be ugly and unkempt, the girl tries to build socialism in a single brothel. But the brothel owner changes Bella's mind when she shows her the baby, a granddaughter who needs expensive medical care. If the girls get involved in politics instead of their duties, there won't be enough money to save granddaughter. Having realized everything, Bella begins to work along the horizontal profile. She has a variety of clients, including per perverts and lovers of the extreme variety, but she dedicates herself body and soul to what she loves. Along the way, Bella meets her colleague Toinette, who literally introduces her to the ideas of socialism. They meet Duncan. After spending all the money, he came back for Bella to rescue her from the maelstrom of low social responsibility. The girl blows him off like a wimp. Bella! She has an existential crisis, having stopped sympathizing with everyone. In London, Max and Godwin receive postcards with stories from Bella. During the lecture, Godwin collapses. When he comes to his senses, he realizes that he needs to occupy his brain with a new experiment to stop pining for his daughter and follow in the footsteps of his father, who valued science and progress so much that he burned his son's genitals with a red-hot iron. The scientists bring back to life a girl named Felicity. Her development is slow and her reactions are inhibited. According to Godwin, this is due to his cold and distant attitude to prevent her from developing emotions and feelings like Bella. All in the name of pure experimentation, the scientist tells Max that he's terminally ill. The assistant can't remove the tumor, so Godwin asks Max to find Bella to see her before he dies. He finds Duncan in the asylum and through him, finds his soulmate. Bella returns to London to her ailing father, wondering where the child inside her is. 
Godwin admits to transplanting the brain of an unborn baby into her. After learning the truth, Bella wonders how she can continue to live this life. She finally decides to marry Max as originally planned. On the appointed day, Godwin leads her to the altar. Suddenly, a certain General Alfie appears at the church. He reveals that Bella is his wife Victoria, the pregnant girl who threw herself off a bridge. He suggests that she return to the family estate. The poor man has been on edge since the day she disappeared. Although Bella does not remember the new boyfriend, she decides to leave Max and runs away with Alfie. An alarm bell rings in the carriage when the new husband, fearing the servants, pulls out a gun. A little more is revealed at dinner. The general confesses that Victoria hated the child and also had an irrepressible sexual appetite that drove her to new adventures. Nevertheless, Alfie is willing to forgive his wife, even though Bella is a completely different person. But he'll take some measures to restrict her movements. From now on, she is forbidden to leave the estate. The girl also notices that he easily threatens the servant with a gun. The next day, she overhears Alfie talking to the doctor. They plan to drug her with a sedative and cut off her clitoris to calm her libido. Now she finally realizes that Victoria left because she could not stand her sadistic husband. When the general calls her in, Bella says she wants to leave, but he pulls out a gun and orders her to drink sleeping pills from a glass. She doesn't want to comply. The girl takes the glass. She throws the contents in Alfie's face and tries to grab his gun. He shoots in fear, wounding himself in the leg. The general can't catch her. The sleeping pill has taken effect. Bella takes Alfie to Godwin's house, where she asks Max for help. He pulls out the bullet, and the girl pulls out the doctor's notes for a new operation. Then Bella and Max lie beside the dying Godwin as his life slips away. In the next scene, they are in the garden. Max gives Bella and Toinette a drink. Housemaid is playing with Felicity, whose skills are developing. And Alfie is frolicking on the lawn, his skull scarred by a goat brain transplant, more suited to his personality. Thank you watching folks, hope you liked it. You can check another interesting recaps in the channel. Don't get left behind. Join me for best movie recaps. Hit that subscribe button, follow me on Twitter and Facebook. Goodbye till the next recap.